Hey, it's Kelly. Welcome back to my channel where we talk all about gentle skincare, sometimes self-care, and today we're talking outdated skincare advice. Oh yeah. You know, there is so much information floating around out there in the interwebs, right? And when it comes to skincare, there's a lot of advice to be had. Most of it, I believe, is well-intentioned, but a lot of it actually is outdated. And I see a lot of the same outdated advice being given out again and again. So today I want to address some of this outdated advice really helped to debunk the reasoning behind it and tell you why we really just don't need to worry about these pieces of advice, why they are outdated. So if you're so ready, give the video a big thumbs up and let's jump right in. So my first piece of outdated advice is to wait 20 minutes after cleansing your face prior to applying vitamin C or acids like AHA. So in order to debunk this one, we gotta go back to seventh grade science and get a basic understanding of the pH scale. So the pH scale ranges from zero to 14. Closer to zero is acidic, closer to 14 is alkaline, and right in the middle, seven, right, is neutral. Now human skin, the pH of human skin ranges between 4.7 and 5.7. So that's why you see um, a lot of skincare products, especially cleansers, will say, hey, we have a pH of 5.5. And that's because that's pretty darn close to human skin. Human skin is actually slightly acidic. And that slightly acidic environment is incredibly beneficial to your skin microbiome. It's incredibly beneficial to your skin barrier. It helps us to resist um, outside aggressors like bacteria bacteria that causes acne, maintaining that slightly acidic environment actually is really optimal for healthy skin. Now there's certain ingredients out there that are considered pH dependent ingredients. These are ingredients like AHA, which needs a pH of about three to four to work optimally. So slightly lower than the um, 5.5 of human skin. And then vitamin C works optimally at about 2.5 to 3.5, that pH range. Now one of the pieces of outdated advice is to wait 20 minutes after washing your face before you apply your vitamin C and AHA. And the idea here is that when you wash your face with cleanser, the uh, surfactants and soap within cleansers actually uh, naturally tend towards the more alkaline side of the pH scale. So remember, closer to 14 rather than the 5.5 that your, your skin is normally at. So when you cleanse, you're raising your pH uh, of the skin a lot higher than the optimal level. So you want to wait 20 minutes for that pH to come back down so that you're at closer to that 5.5. When you put your vitamin C on, it's going to work a lot better than when your pH level is kind of artificially raised, maybe closer to like a seven or an eight, right? A little bit more alkaline. So the reason that that piece of advice is outdated is because most cleansers don't have that high of a pH anymore. This used to be true. So this advice is rooted in truth. It's just not really the reality and truth of the present day. And I'm speaking from experience because I've been into skincare for a really long time. And I remember learning about low pH cleansers. You can see a lot of content from me talking about low pH cleansers and the pH being 5.5 and why that's so important. It is important and many years ago it was a lot harder to find a lot of cleansers were harsher they uh, did have a more alkaline um, type of pH they were more stripping to the skin but nowadays because you know we are so much more knowledgeable about skin and skincare and consumers are much more knowledgeable as well right there's a greater demand for uh, pH respective cleansers gentle cleansers there's been such a, um, a sufficient sophistication in formulation and the use of gentle surfactants, alternative surfactants, that the pH of the cleanser is more likely to be 5.5 or around 6 than it is to be around 8, 9, or 10. So if you're using vitamin C, you're using AHA, follow the directions on the bottle. Every formula will dictate how it should be used. The, the textures, the, um, the delivery vehicle, um, and method of the ingredients of that particular product, just read the instructions. If it says apply after cleansing, apply after cleansing. If it says apply after serums, do that. Listen to the instructions on the individual products. We have to take those into consideration. We don't have to overly scientify, right? 
that even a word? We don't have to make things complicated, I guess is what I'm saying. Just use the products, follow the instructions, and don't worry about the rest. If you're concerned about the pH of your cleanser, you can check out my cleanser playlist to find lots of gentle, low pH, skin respective cleansers. Only use skincare with actives. This is an outdated piece of advice that I really want to debunk because I think that this is something that is well-intentioned. I think the idea behind this is don't waste your time or your money on extra products that you don't need. Really focus in on active ingredients that are gonna give you the benefits that you're looking for. The word active means the ingredients that are responsible for the benefits that are showing up on your skin. And so generally people regard actives as exfoliants, I think especially AHAs, BHAs. Um, I see a lot of um, active, you know, wording around retinols um, and even niacinamide, which is not really an exfoliant, but I think we do regard niacinamide as an active ingredient in some communities. But did you know that there's a whole world of active skincare ingredients out there that aren't exfoliants, that aren't aggressive ingredients, that aren't vitamin C and exfoliants and retinoids and all of that, right? Did you know ceramides are an active ingredient? Did you know shea butter is an active ingredient? Glycerin is an active ingredient. And so first and foremost, the gap in knowledge between what is an active and what isn't, I think is pretty large. And so I don't think that this advice is helpful just on that front because that language is confusing. Well, what, what makes a you know, ingredient active or inactive, right? While I do think that there is a lot of value on concentrating on the ingredients that are going to give the benefits that you're looking for, I think when it comes to building a routine, especially when you're just getting into skincare, the biggest confusion is around ingredients. You may not know exactly what you want to achieve on your skin. You may want to try all the products out there, right? And if you don't really know what the active ingredient is in a formula, you're not really going to know what the product's going to do for you because marketing can claim anything that they want to, right, to, to a certain extent. And so it's not very helpful to read marketing claims, but it can be so beneficial to understand how to read an ingredients list and kind of get yourself familiar with ingredients that give the benefits that you're looking to achieve. And I think that that's the heart of this advice, but I think that that gets lost because as I mentioned, the gap in knowledge around what's active and what's inactive, it just, you know, like the average person just doesn't know. And as I mentioned earlier, it's gonna be dependent on the formula too. So I don't love this advice because I think it encourages people to build um, routines that may be a little aggressive for their skin. Like I said, I think a lot of people think only exfoliants, only retinoids, only vitamin C, when we think about actives. And I think that that could lead people to creating routines that might um, irritate their skin or weaken or damage their moisture barrier. I also think that this advice puts a lot of shame on the people who do choose willingly to add additional products into their routine that don't contain those types of ingredients, things like toners and essences and maybe emulsions and oils, you know, things that maybe would really benefit their skin, but there's a lot of shame around that because, well, it's not active. You know what I mean? You're just wasting your money. You're flushing your money down the toilet on a hydrating toner. That's not doing anything for you. It's just water. Um, and I'll address that one in a little bit, don't you worry. But I think that there's a lot of, um a lot of shame around that for certain folks in certain communities in skincare that will say, oh, you're just being really extra. You know, it's really unnecessary. You don't have to put all that onto your face. And sometimes you don't, but a lot of people just enjoy it. You know, and so I think that this advice can kind of take some of that joy and some of that self care and that that kind of like a moment for me out of skincare because it has to be about actives, it has to be about benefits, it has to, you know, it has to be effective. But you can also just enjoy multiple layers of skincare. You can just kind of enjoy the process of pampering yourself. And so that's the reason why I think this is outdated. I don't think that we should be throwing this advice around willy nilly. I think it just confuses the matter. And I think that it really takes a lot of light off of balancing out your skin. And when I talk about balancing out your skin, I'm talking about skin types that are not considered normal or balanced. 
So I'm talking oily skin, combination skin, dry skin. And while it's not a skin type, it's a skin condition, dehydrated skin. The majority of people in the world have some of those conditions or skin types, right? Um, I think that not the majority of the population has a balanced skin type. If you have a balanced skin type and you like the minimal idea of just using actives, you're probably good to go. But if you have an imbalanced skin type, you will actually benefit from getting some type of hydration and moisture, getting that balance right in your routine. And sometimes that can't be achieved solely by using active ingredients in a basic skincare routine. Sometimes you have to add an extra product. Sometimes you have to go for ingredients that may not be considered active, but can really make your skin feel so much more comfortable, that can balance out the imbalances, that can help to control oil, that can help to address dry flaky skin, that can help to address dehydration. And so, as I said, I think that only use active ingredients is a well-intentioned statement, but I think that it ends up being confusing in the long run. Now, speaking of toners and essences, I said I would address it, right? As I mentioned earlier, toners and essences are often the products that get under fire when it comes to only use active ingredients in your skincare routines, because often toners and essences um, have some mix of hydrating ingredients, maybe some, maybe some emollient ingredients, they're meant to balance out the skin, but they're not usually delivering exfoliation or the, the common active ingredients. So they're often seen as frivolous, extra, and unnecessary. Now, do I believe everybody out there would benefit from using an essence or a toner in their routine? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I think that they're unnecessarily maligned um, in the greater skincare community as, as I mentioned, being extra and unnecessary. If you have an imbalanced skin type, meaning you don't have normal skin. You have oily, dry, or combination skin. You might actually benefit from a toner or essence in addition to your other skincare products. If you have oily skin, um, that means that your skin overproduces sebum, right? And sometimes that can be tamed by additional hydration and humectant ingredients added into your skincare products. If you have dry skin, it means that your skin lacks oil. It doesn't produce enough of its oil that's why it's so dry. And that skin type will benefit from more emo um, emollient type of ingredients or, and oils as well. If you have combination skin, that means that you have both of those conditions in different areas of your face. I have combination skin. I can get quite oily in my T-zone, but very dry in my U-zone. And dehydrated skin is not a skin type. It can happen if you're oily, it can happen if you're dry or combination. It's a skin condition that's related to the health of your moisture barrier, but that skin condition um, definitely it lacks hydration, right? You're losing water through transepidermal water loss. And so one of the steps to addressing that skin condition is to replenish your skin with hydration. So you can see how there's so many skin types and conditions that can benefit from just adding pure hydration. Again, commonly not um, considered active um, ingredients, panthenol, glycerin, right? They technically are but they're not really well known for being that. And so toners, I think especially, get written off as um, unnecessary, but they can actually really benefit those skin types that I just mentioned. And there's such a big wide world out there, especially if you get into Korean skincare products, you can actually get moisturizing toners that have hydration, but they also have that moisturizing element, that emollient um, element. Some of them even have oil in them that are particularly helpful for helping to balance out dry skin. We have those really light, watery, very hydrating toner and essence products that are particularly helpful for oily skin and for combination skin. Dehydrated skin, you can pack in so many different humectants that can not only um, replenish the skin and help with the symptoms of dehydration, but some of these ingredients actually do help fortify your barrier as well, like panthenol. So I think that it's just so simplistic to write them off as unnecessary and extra because they actually can really help to balance out the skin. And if you've ever uh, had imbalanced skin, if your dehydration has ever been out of control, if you've never been able to solve your dry skin, or if your like uh, overproduction of oil has just like really affected your life, you know what I'm saying? Getting those in, in balance, getting your skin feeling comfortable again is huge. And so I hate that people write these products off. Are they for everybody? No, but can a 
lot of people benefit from them? And does this advice actually turn people away from products that could make their skin feel better? Yeah, it's super outdated. I hate hearing it. Just drink water. Oh, I see this advice given out nearly daily and it drives me up the wall. I think because it can feel very dismissive of people's actual struggles with their skin. Like just drink water, girl. So let's break it down here because I'm not saying don't drink water, it's not important. That's not what I'm saying at all. I am literally drinking a glass of water right now because hydration is so important for the health of your body. So definitely if you're not drinking the recommended daily amount of water, do work on that because water helps everything in our body work more efficiently. And of course it is possible if you're severely dehydrated day after day, or just not drinking enough water, that it could show up on your skin. You could have some issues because if the rest of your body's not functioning optimally, your organs and your digestion and all of that, why would you expect your skin to look glowy and healthy? Like why would you, right? So. I'm not saying that you shouldn't like worry about your water intake. You definitely should work on that if it's an issue for you. But if you're a pretty well hydrated human being, I consider myself to be a well hydrated human being. I drink a lot of water um, throughout the day. It makes me feel great, but it really doesn't affect my skin. And I see this piece of advice, just drink water, thrown around a lot for people who do suffer with dehydrated skin. So dehydrated skin is when you lose water uh, through your skin through transepidermal water loss and it is has nothing to do with the amount of water in your body if you're drinking the optimal amounts of water throughout the day and you're still suffering with that kind of deep down within your skin tight and dry feeling it's not dry and flaky at the top of your skin you could actually be covered in oil and deep down in your skin you feel this like tightness within your your skin it's like and it especially starts to come out like in the middle of the afternoon you're just like i just want to apply a bunch of skincare products because my skin doesn't feel comfortable. That is probably dehydration and drinking more of this ain't going to do it. It's just not going to meaningfully hydrate your skin in any way whatsoever. And so I think that this advice is actually pretty harmful uh, because it completely dismisses dehydrated skin as a condition and it completely obscures the cure for it because you can actually fix your dehydrated skin, but just telling somebody to drink water is gonna put them on the completely wrong path. Dehydration, as I mentioned, it's not a skin type. It's actually a skin condition because it's linked back to the health of your skin barrier. If your skin barrier is not strong, um, basically you want to think about your skin barrier as a bunch of, of skin cells that are glued together with lipids. These lipids help to hold hydration and moisture deep into the skin. And it's actually a two-way barrier. Not only does it hold things in, but it actually helps to block things out like environmental aggressors like pollution. And it also helps to resist the acne bacteria. So sometimes dehydration is also a Accompanied with breakouts because bacteria is penetrating through the skin barrier, that protective layer on the skin. And so it's actually really a two-step process uh, for dehydrated skin. The first is to replenish the water that's being lost from your skin through humectant ingredients. And that's why I'm such a fan of hydrating toners and why it annoys me when people say they're not necessary because they actually can help to ease the symptoms, that tight, itchy feeling, irritation deep within the skin when you suffer with dehydration and they can actually help you out a lot. So it's like hydrate your skin with skincare, right? But then the second step to that is to strengthen up your skin barrier. And that's where the ceramides, cholesterol, and fatty acids come in. Those are the three main components of your moisture barrier. When you apply it topically through skincare, they do actually strengthen up. They do work. They strengthen up your moisture barrier. And then your skin is naturally going to be able to hold on to more of its hydration. Some people's bodies are just more prone to a weak moisture barrier. That's me. My body's just not super duper efficient at creating a lot of its own ceramides, cholesterol, and fatty acids. So supplementing through skincare has been like a uh, skin changing, life changing, mind blowing. It has been a huge game changer for me to understand that. If I had just followed the advice to, to drink a bunch of water, 
I don't know where I would be today because <laughs> it would have led me down the completely wrong path. So um, don't just throw that advice out willy nilly. Um, it is very important for the overall health of your body. Being hydrated is important. Most people are not optimally hydrated, but if you are and you're still suffering with problems, don't listen to these people. Just drinking water is not going to do it. Another piece of outdated advice that I see getting thrown around a lot to this day is to use your photosensitizing ingredients at nighttime in order to easily avoid the sun. <sighs> okay, this one. <laughs> Let's unpack it. So the idea here is that there are certain ingredients in skincare that make your skin more sensitive to the sun, photosensitizing, right? Um, one of the most common ones is AHA. So your lactic acid, glycolic acid, mandalic acid. Um, these types of, of products actually do make your skin more vulnerable to burning in um, in exposure to UV, but also um, can open you up to more damage from UV rays, especially if you're not wearing sunscreen. And I see this advice um, being given out a lot to, to use it at nighttime, because then you don't have to worry about your sunscreen use, right? Because you put it on at night, you wash it off in the morning, and your skin has never seen the sun while the AHA was on your skin. Uh, this just is not true. This isn't actually how these ingredients work or why the ingredients make your skin sensitive in the first place. The contact of AHA on the skin, the actual like layer of AHA on your skin is not what makes your skin sensitive to the sun. It's the exfoliation mechanism of AHA. Because AHA exfoliates the top of surface of like dead skin cells off of your skin, revealing newer, fresher like baby skin, think about it that way. That's why that skin is more vulnerable to damage from the sun because it hasn't really kind of like hardened off. You've just like, you've kind of forced that skin skin cell shedding process to happen a lot faster than your body might have been ready for it. And so that skin is just very, very new and very vulnerable. And that means even when you put AHA on and wash it off, that effect is still on your skin. Like if you want to think about it, like the damage is done, you can think about it that way. Like what's done is done, right? It cannot be undone, which means that your skin is going to be sensitive to the sun from just one application of AHA up to a week after using it. And that's not, I'm not talking about consistently using it throughout that week. I'm saying you put it on on a Sunday, your skin is still going to be vulnerable to the sun um, more so um, up until like Sunday or Monday of that following week. So it's really important to understand why and how it makes your skin more sensitive. And in fact, you will see that the FDA does actually regulate the, the marketing and the uh, language around the use of AHAs in products on the American American market and they will say um, that you should be using a sunscreen when you're continuously using this product. You must apply sunscreen whenever you go out into the sun and up to one week after discontinuing use. It's there for a reason because your skin is still sensitive. So this advice is super duper outdated. Um, I think it was like one of those like, like, hey, tricky ways. I don't have to wear sunscreen. I'm just going to apply it at night. Um, but it's obviously just not based in fact at all. So I want to know, would you like to see another video like this? I had a lot of fun putting it together. I, sometimes, you know, I just got to get it off my chest. So it felt really good to debunk and break down some of this advice that I personally feel is pretty outdated. If you want to see another one. I do have a few more ideas, so let me know if you're interested. And if there is a piece of advice that you've heard thrown around the skincare community that you're not really sure is true or if it's worth following, let me know in the comments. And if I do another video, you might see it in there. If this video was helpful to you, please, I would love it if you would consider hitting subscribe. I do release a lot of new skincare videos throughout the week. I do long form video shorts, and I also have a skincare video podcast as well. So turn on notifications so you're never out of the loop. I hope you are healthy, happy, and safe. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I love you so much, and I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye.